Welcome to Clarity Fun Podcast with Dr. Owen Anderson. We're on episode 26 and we're continuing in our special series, Rebuilding the Historic Christian Faith, brought to us by Logos Theological Seminary with Dr. Surendra Gangadine. And we're looking today, last time we looked at the Westminster Confession of Faith and especially at the doxological focus in the confession that our chief end or highest good is to know God in all that by which he makes himself known in all of his works of creation and providence. And today we're going to turn to the modern world or the modern age and the challenges that have been raised up to the historic Christian faith in the modern age and the way that these require deeper responses if we're going to continue to uh, rebuild that historic Christian faith. So, uh, Dr. Ganey, thank you for being with us again. Glad to be here, Owen. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what is what is the modern age? What makes it distinct from the classical or medieval periods? Well, there was the Reformation uh, that was a decisive break with the medieval world as it was governed by papal authority and that in itself was grounded in particular interpretations from the past of Plato, Platonism, Plotinus, and Aristotle under um, Aquinas. So there was a break in the worldview in a number of ways. Um, we reached to a natural height of consciousness and consistency in understanding the historic Christian faith in the Westminster Confession, especially as it's read thoughtfully and we see the focus of the on the glory of God and the knowledge of the glory of God. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever in all that by which he makes himself known, in all of his works of creation and providence. And even though we reached that high watermark, subsequent generations did not build faithfully on that foundation and we progressively lost more and more so that today in post-modernity we have very little of that. What does remain is some is more traditionally reformed or soteriologically reformed at best in tiny quarters. And so, is this sometimes called a post-Christian age? I think it that's a term that's being used. Um, Europe is post-Christian, sometimes neo-pagan, going back to its uh, pre-Christian roots. And um, it's, how shall I put this? Post-Christian may be broader than just post-Reformation. Yeah. Post-Reformation applies to the uh, conditions in Europe. But with the rise of many other civilizations, each seeking its place in the sun, Christianity is no longer unchallenged in its position of leadership. So some are raising the question where, uh, where, where in light of all the other worldviews and the long-standing nature of these, whether we're not simply that's Christianity is not simply one among many, not one to be extended over all. So we'll pick up on that idea of a post-Christian world when we get into post-modernity. But here, well, and I wonder, I wonder if it has some of its roots in the uh, wars of religion. Which, when we were looking at the Confession, that's that's basically being written at the same time that those wars are ending. Um, the Peace of Westphalia is in 1648. Yes, we'll be uh, talking about that. We just want to get 
why we speak of modernity. Try to address yeah. that. And that's from the negative side, the break with the medieval. But there's a positive break with it. And the positive break began with challenges to the medieval worldview. Yeah. These challenges came through uh, expanding our horizons of what is in the world. Uh, in geography, there were explorers uh, going across the oceans and around the continents and discovering just how um, huge, large, great the world was and discovering many other cultures in a way that, although they may have had dim awareness of it before, it became striking because this was not simply by report, but by actual presence in these cultures. The world was expanded uh, in, in terms of the cosmos through astronomy, um, Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler, uh, moving from a geocentric to a, well, they thought, um, at least we're not geocentric, sun goes around the earth. Um, but this was the one aspect of science, there are many other aspects that were coming into focus, uh, discoveries in medicine, in chemistry, in every area of investigation, uh, plant life, animal life, as well as uh, human culture. And with these expansion in science, there came um, inventions that uh, revolutionized the way in which we live together. We speak about the Industrial Revolution. At some point, there'd be other aspects of um, this. We had early on the printing press that expanded the reach of knowledge to many. So there were challenges to the medieval worldview, uh, theoretically and practically. Um, and that is where the modern world began. We speak about Christopher Columbus in 1492, um, discovering the New World and others, um, explorers going far. But it was an age of expansion of the horizons and leaving behind the medieval worldview. And then the second main point here is that there was a rediscovery of classical culture the Hellenistic culture, by contact with uh, refugees from the fall of Constantinople, as well as contact with uh, Arab philosophers, uh, some interaction there. Uh, there was a rebirth of uh, interest in the classical culture, and again, leaving um, the medieval worldview from its position of Dominance. This happened over decades and centuries, but it definitely began in a particular way with the Renaissance. And then there was the Reformation, which was a return to the historic Christian faith, along with return to original sources. Go back to the sources, the ad fontes, the interest in Greek and uh, Greek manuscripts that came from Constantinople or Byzantium. And... Um, the Reformation uh, is not a departure, but a reforming Christianity based on what was historically present. So the second major challenge and break and advance from the medieval world was through the Renaissance and Reformation. That produced a series of wars on many levels. Um, the unity that was in Christendom earlier was challenged in every way, even within the Reformation, between the magisterial reformers and the more radical 
Anabaptist wing, and even among the more magisterial, even between Lutherans and Reformed. And so there are many conflicts and wars of religion that lasted quite some time, as quite devastating, and it finally came to an end about the same time that the Westminster Confession of Faith was completed, and there was an agreement called the Peace of Westphalia uh, in 1648, which allowed the religion of the prince to determine the religion of the realm. But, but I think it had important protections for the minority religion. That was part of the, the peace, uh, was that the prince couldn't enforce his religion on the whole realm. Yes. Thanks for mentioning that, clarifying that. And a third main aspect of modernity is the Enlightenment. Um, turning to other sources of knowledge than Scripture and the Church, and what men turn to, uh, and apart from tradition, what men turn to is what they could know and have direct access to, through rationalism, there was um, the rationalist development under Descartes and Leibniz and Spinoza. And they also turned to empiricism, a knowledge through senses, um, through Locke, Berkeley, and Hume. And this, uh, and then moving into Kant, who gave a kind of model for the Enlightenment dare to reason. Use your own reason. Do, do not be childish and dependent on external authorities. The Enlightenment can be culminated to culminate in the expression of deism, at least the first phase, where there's an affirmation of God known from nature by reason or experience, and there's no reference to scripture or providence in terms of redemptive history. And it was thought that what we know of God from creation is sufficient. The question remains whether the deists did justice to the use of reason to know all that they can and should know from uh, general revelation. But they furthered the break, especially among the uh, intelligentsia, the um, intellectuals, and the... I wonder if there was, a, there was a kind of worry about superstition. So reason got po po put against superstitious beliefs. Yes. And then any, any appeal to a, a religious mystery or a miracle was put under the, the umbrella of a superstition. Well, there was... And so the, the deists would reject ultimately... Well, we reject stories of miracles and the deity of Christ, and this gave rise to the Unitarians. Yes, all reference to uh, testimony and where it did go under the medieval, late medieval period, with um, seen as ignorance and superstition, and we wanted to be done with that and the dark ages that came from that ignorance and superstition, hence enlightenment as the term yeah. to describe it. So that would include all reference to scriptures, all testimony. It's only what we can know directly for ourselves from reason and it sense experience. So yes, miracles was one of the um, touch buttons, as well as um, prophecy in scripture. Yeah, and, I, wonder, and, I wonder too if... if Faith, if, if, I think one of the things that we'll see as we look at modernity is the tension between faith and reason. But if it's really a tension between reason and superstition. It's really a conflict between skepticism and fideism. Supposedly yeah. uh, reason and experience leading to skepticism of religious matters. But then positively about the ultimate questions we don't know, we can't know. And under yeah. fideism would be included all religious beliefs not based on proof grounded in understanding. So um, 
it's a complex uh, relation, not just science and religion or faith and reason, but what we mean by each and the extent right. to which each was being used. For example, I believe that the deist and the rationalist and the empiricist came short in the use of reason and experience. And that generated a lot of tension from their side. We cover this point that if the deist uh, would answer the question, if God is all good and all powerful, known from general revelation, why is there evil, uh, including uh, physical death, they would have seen from general revelation the reality of God acting to bring in the curse and with the curse the promise and the need for redemptive revelation. So it was a failure on the part of the deists. Hume died in 1776, publishing the work Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion. He wrestled with the problem of reason. But some of the persons, Cleanthes and Demia, against whom he wrestled, were really uh, short, uh, kind of a straw man, straw men, or straw persons, if you wish. Hmm. And... Um, so it's not that you have reason on one side and faith on the other. Both sides came short of the principle of clarity that the basic things about God and man and good and evil are clear to reason. And until we get back to that and rebuild on that and clarity and inexcusability, we can't and won't have anything. I wonder if that skepticism really is the hallmark of the modern age because the wars of religion seem to end in a skeptical draw and cement the idea that we can't have theological knowledge. I think that is uh, true, but the um, Westminster Confession is saying uh, the light of nature shows that there is a God uh, who is all good and all powerful. The, po the power, wisdom, and goodness of God is seen, and it's clear so that men are inexcusable. Um, we didn't build on that. Right. There are a number of reasons in terms of the restoration of Charles II and the disestablishment of um, the Puritan influence in England and how that's had an effect on the exodus to America. So there are a lot of things going on. But right now we're doing an overview and we're saying that um, the Enlightenment ran its course and continued to have its influence. Kant tried to reconcile the claims of reason and experience and um, I believe he failed, sadly, badly. And Hegel picked up and tried to speak about the noumenal world Schopenhauer tried to, Marx inverted that Hegelianism, but still in the realm of skepticism, concerning the nature of the world, we cannot know. It is the mind that imposes its categories upon the um, content of sensu sensory in, uh, input and intuition and shapes it so we can only know phenomena the world as it appears to us, not the world as it is in itself. So that's kind of radical form of skepticism at the root. But that's just to say there was a failure to use reason and a failure to understand and critique experience correctly. And the unfolding of uh, the empiricism, the questions of empiricism from Locke to Barclay to Hume, who went in skepticism, shows the difficulties and failures of attempting to establish a basis of knowledge uh, without the full use of reason, the critical use at the basic level as a test for meaning. The fourth point we want to mention here is uh, coming out of the Enlightenment is naturalism. Naturalism says that the world is governed by natural law. And then they extended that to say the world originates by natural law. So initially, Newton was a uh, theist, at least a deist, and he affirmed, discovered natural law in the cosmos, in the um, laws of physics that he 
announced and mathematically expressed. Uh, and that was very impressive development from Galileo. And it was natural to think that the world is operating by laws. And that's the correct way to look at it. It operates by natural laws, but how it operates is not the same as how it originates. The problem came in when they try to extend how it operates to how it originates. At that point, they go beyond science, beyond what can be empir empirically ver uh, verified. So this naturalism extended to Darwin. Only natural forces operate. The forces not operating have always operated. And essentially the same magnitude, Charles Lyell, early in the uh, 19th century, Darwin picks up on that, applies it to what he observes, coupled with the leftovers of deism that left it wide open about the curse in nature. Darwin's main objection or, or support for evolution is that he couldn't believe that God created a world that is red in tooth and claw to cite one of his followers. And it was a problem of evil, failure of the church when it lost out to deism and then now to naturalism. And that evolutionary view, as well as natural law governing the cosmos and natural law governing the origin of life became dominant. God was uh, now fully removed from the foundation. There was no creation, uh, excuse me, uh, no providence with deism, and now extended naturalism went to saying there's no creation. It up, everything is by natural law. This uh, naturalism led, gave rise to another main phase of the modern world, and that is secularism. Secularism, as it came to be expressed, particularly by Marx, built a naturalism, uh, all is material, and he applies it particularly to economics and the oppression between those who have and have not, and wanted to uh, overthrow all of the uh, oppression of the rich or the powerful over the weak or the poor, and establish a uh, more just society. Um, this is the strong advance of the push toward uh, utopianism, to come bring into focus an ideal uh, society. But it's the city of man, no longer the city of God, and it's entirely focused on this world, not on the world to come. Religion for Marx was the sigh of the oppressed, uh, the opiate of the people, something to comfort people in this veil of tears until they depart from it. Uh, Marx wanted to bring about change in the world. So Christianity, insofar it, as it was uh, focused on salvation from this life for heaven, left the door wide open for secularism to arise and take its place. And we have a kind of hope in secularism to change the world, make it a better place, this world, compared with um, Christian view of escaping and being delivered from it. Secularism then became a, a major aspect of the modern world. And there were a series of revolutions that were occurring in connection with this focus on life in this world. It overthrew the last remnants of monarchy, certain in the uh, revolution in uh, the colonies, overthrowing the British monarchy's influence. It overthrew the aristocracy and the benefits of that group surrounding the king and the feudal order that um, encouraged serfdom for the populace. And in this place, they wanted liberty, equality, and hopefully fraternity for all. Um, there was a lot of arbitrariness in absolute monarchy, whether in any form that it was in the uh, 16th century, excuse me, 17th century, coming into the 18th, 
and they wanted to overthrow man's rule and law and in its place put in a law that is originating not from man but from nature and perhaps express itself in constitutions that uh, guarantee a kind of fairness in life. So there was the um, American Revolution, the French Revolution, and uh, another significant was the Russian Revolution in the early 20th century. And that spirit that was advanced by Napoleon throughout Europe and challenged uh, monarchies everywhere. So that's a, another significant aspect of modernity. The last aspect we'll mention is the empires that were building upon the discovery of the new world and reaching out to every part of the globe where European powers try to carve up the world among themselves and establish empires and colonizing uh, the people, reducing them to uh, subservience to their interests. Now, it wasn't, it was mixed. It wasn't all just a power play. Some wanted to extend the uh, benefits of Christian civilization and Christianity to all parts of the world. But the empires had um, kind of carved up the world among themselves and competed one with another. The French and the British and the Dutch and then the Germans and the Russians and others got in on it too. The Japan wanted to. Well, that whole movement from empires and colonialism um, in the 17, 18, 19, 20th century came to a head in two world wars in the middle of the second decade, 1914 to 1918, 19, and then World War II from anywhere from 38, 37, going on up to um, 45. Now, what happened here is that we see during this period the rise and fall of empires, not only in the West, but around the world. There was the um, Western attempt to extend the Hungarian rule in Europe and around the world. The Spanish rose and fell, the French rose and fell, then the Germans attempted under Hitler to Third Reich to establish freedom, not only freedom from others, but rule over others. The British Empire came to an end um, decline after World War II, and Japan rose and fell uh, fully by the end of World War II. So we should remember that there were empires in the world before this. There were three phases of uh, empires in the Mesopotamian Valley, uh, old well, from from Babel to old Babylonian on the Hammurabi down to uh, new Babylon under Hammurabi, excuse me, under um, Nebuchadnezzar. There was the, Assyri the Egyptians and the Assyrians and the Hittites. Um, after Babel, uh, Babylon, there was uh, Persia, Greece, and Rome. At this time, there were the Indian civilizations rising and falling, Chinese, and um, as well as what is going on in the Central and South America, the Mayan and the Incas. These are empires that rose and fell long before the European empires uh, rose and fell. And World War II, the end of World War II, marked a distinct phase. And we could say that's the end of modernity. And we'll see what new configurations occurred subsequent to that. 
But modernity began with challenges to the medieval worldview, developed into empires that rise and fell, in the midst of which there were um, enlightenment, naturalism, secularism, as well as earlier the Renaissance and Reformation. These all came to an end. And we could say that the modern period um, had the seeds of destruction from the beginning and came to full manifestation by the time we come to the end of World War II. And that's to characterize some of the challenges that came up and what we need to respond to. There was a failure to know, a failure of the Enlightenment to achieve knowledge. Yeah, I was about to say that it, it seems like the challenges can be summarized really into the three areas of philosophy. There's an epistemological challenge about knowledge. Yes, and the worldview of naturalism, then, metaphysical. Yeah, then that, yeah, a challenge about what is real, and metaphysical. The, and the view of what is good based on naturalism, which is uh, either utilitarianism, greatest good for the greatest number, or ethical egoism, both focusing on pleasure as a good, um, some remnants of virtue ethic, but it was a philosophical foundations collapsed yeah. and brought us to the end of modernity, and we'll pick up with post-modernity after this. Next time. Good. Well, thank you. I think this, this helps give an overview of what challenges have come up at, at, after the Westminster Confession, which which coincides with the ends of end of the wars of religion, yes, and this modern age, which we're now uh, dealing with the after effects of it. So yes. next time we'll pick up on that. What is the postmodern age, and then we'll be able to hopefully give a good picture of the challenges that are that are there that that require us to go deeper in the faith. Yes, we can go back and go over uh, particular parts like. Um, the Enlightenment and the philosophers and who they were and what were the moves and maneuvers they make, as well as naturalism and many other names that could be. This is only an overview. There's a yeah. lot more to be said. Um, we're aware of that, but we're only giving an overview right now. Well, good. Thank you for, for that insight. And thank you, everyone, for being with us today as we consider... Our, continue our series, Rebuilding the Historic Christian Faith. Thank you, Owen.